Hello, and welcome to the online edition of Linux Fest Northwest 2020. My name is Samuel Karp, and today I'd like to talk to you about how Linux containers work. I usually run this talk open for discussion and welcome folks to interrupt me to ask questions. However, this is a recorded talk, so that doesn't really work. Instead, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them online. Linux Fest Northwest is operating a discussion board at https colon slash slash discuss.lfnw.org, and there will be a thread about this talk posted there. I'll be watching that thread to answer any questions you have. I'm also on Twitter and happy to answer questions about containers there as well. My Twitter handle is at Samuel Karp. Since this is a recording, you can't really ask me to stop and explain again, but you also have the benefit of being able to control how you watch. Feel free to slow me down if I'm too fast, speed me up if I'm too slow, and rewind to watch again if you missed something. I won't mind. I can't tell how you're watching anyway. We're going to cover a few different technologies that make up Linux containers. Here's the agenda. I'm also going to have a title slide before each section if you want to jump around the video. Let's start off today with an overview of the different primitives that make up containers. Containers are a mechanism to run Linux processes with some degree of isolation and separation. Containers are a combination of a few different primitives in Linux. What we think of as a container is really a particular way of combining these different primitives together. It's useful to have an understanding of what those primitives are and how they can be used both for troubleshooting and for designing your own systems. Using these primitives to make a container is one thing you can do, but you can also mix and match these primitives in other ways that can be useful. There are three primitives that make up the core of what we think of as a container. There are a few others involved as well, but these three are really the key ones I want to focus on. They are control groups, namespaces, and file systems. These primitives are used with regular Linux processes, and using them together in particular ways makes what we think of as a container. For each of these technologies we're going to talk about, we'll start with an explanation of the technology and then do a demo showing it in action. Unfortunately, as this is a recording, they won't really be live demos, but you should be able to repeat the steps that I'm running on your own and play around yourself. The first primitive I want to talk about today is control groups or C groups. Control groups are a Linux system for tracking, grouping, and organizing the processes that run. Every process is tracked with C groups, regardless of whether it's in a container or not. C groups are typically used to associate processes with resources. With a C group, you can track how much a group of processes are using for a given kind of resource. C groups also give you the ability to limit or prioritize what resources are available to a group of processes. The way you interact with C groups is through subsystems. The control groups feature of Linux is really an abstract framework, and the subsystems are the concrete implementations that are bound to resources. There are a bunch of different subsystems available in Linux. You can see some of them on the right of this slide. All of the ones listed here, and most of the ones you'd have enabled on your system, are resource controllers, meaning that they can track or limit a particular kind of resource for the processes assigned to the group. One of the important things here is that each of the subsystems are independent. They can organize processes separately from each other. This means you might have a single CPU C group with two processes in it, but those same two processes be assigned to two different memory C groups. All of the C group subsystems arrange processes in a hierarchy. Each subsystem has an independent hierarchy. Every task or process ID running on the host is represented in exactly one of the C groups within a given subsystem hierarchy. Independent hierarchies allow for more expressive segmentation across resource types. This allows you to do things like have two processes share the total amount of memory that they consume, but give one process more CPU time than the other. Some resource controllers apply settings from the parent level to the child levels, while others consider each level in the hierarchy independently. For example, the devices controller uses this kind of inheritance, while the memory controller can be configured either way. When a new process is started, it begins in the same C groups as its parent process. You can interact with C groups via a virtual file system, typically mounted at slash sys slash fs slash C group. A bunch of files and directories appear here, but they're really just interfaces into the kernel's data structures for C groups. Each directory inside a given subsystem's root represents a C group. In each directory, you'll see a file called tasks. This file holds all of the process IDs for the processes assigned to that particular C group. Other files let you read settings and utilization data, or change the settings. To move a process to a different C group, all you need to do is to write the process ID into the target C group's tasks file. On the right, you can see an example of the CPU C group. Other subsystems have different virtual files. Let's take a look at C groups together. I'm showing you a regular Linux terminal. 
We talked about the cgroup virtual file system, so let's start out by taking a look at that. You can see here the set of cgroup subsystems that are enabled on this computer. Inside each of these directories is the hierarchy for that particular cgroup subsystem. Let's start by looking at the device's cgroup. Here you can see the files that control how the cgroup subsystem itself is configured, prefixed with cgroup. You can also see files that are related to the devices, prefixed with devices. There's also a file called tasks that we talked about before. This file contains all of the process IDs that are associated with this cgroup. This shows you all of the processes that are in this particular cgroup inside this particular subsystem. But suppose that you have an arbitrary process and you want to find out which cgroups it's assigned to. You can do that with the PROC virtual file system. Let's look at that. The PROC file system contains a directory that corresponds to each process ID. The shell that we're running right now is a regular process and is represented here. We can get the shell's process ID by using a special variable like this. And then we can look at the cgroups that this shell is inside. You can see all of the cgroups here. Most of them are just at the root directory for that particular subsystem, indicated by the single slash. Now I want to show you what it looks like to move a process into a different cgroup and then change some settings on that cgroup. We can make a new cgroup by creating a new directory. Even though we just made a directory and didn't create any files, we can see the set of virtual files that are automatically created by this cgroup subsystem. The tasks file lists all of the processes that are associated with the cgroup. We just created this one, so it should be empty. Let's write this current shell into the tasks file so the shell is moved into the cgroup. We should now be able to see this move in the corresponding entry in PROC, so we can look at that file again. And we can see here it listed as PIDs colon slash LFNW. We should see it in the file that we just wrote as well. You can see another process ID here as well, in addition to the shell. This is the process ID of the cat process that we're running. Since every child process inherits its cgroups from the parent, and since the shell is the parent process to cat, this is what we would expect. If we run this again, you'll see that the process ID keeps changing. The PID C group controls the number of processes that can run. Processes are a resource in the kernel, and having too many can cause resource exhaustion. The PID C group lets us limit the impact of mistakes or attacks like fork bombs. I want to take a look at what it looks like to have a limit, so let's get three processes instead of two. Now we're running cat inside a subshell. So we have the original shell, the subshell, and cat. And we'll see both of these PIDs change as we run the command repeatedly. The limit is controlled by the PIDs.max file. Right now it's set to the value max, which indicates it's not limited. Let's go ahead and write a limit into it. Now we've written a limit here. We can try running some processes and see that it works. Now let's try running three processes instead of two and we can see the error here. Okay, so this shell's broken. Let's go get a new one that isn't bound by this C group. Now I want to show you what it looks like when Docker uses C groups. I'm going to run a container with a CPU resource control. I'm running this container in the background so we can examine it from both inside and outside. We can run commands inside the container with Docker exec. Inside the container, we can examine what the C groups look like. We're going to look at the CPU subsystem, since that's a setting we used on the Docker command line. You can see here that there are no directories inside this top-level directory. Let's look at the cpu.shares file here. It looks like our settings got applied to the root C group, but that's just from the container's perspective. Let's look at what it looks like outside the container as well. Docker likes to organize the container C groups inside a Docker directory, so let's look there. We can see a directory that corresponds to our container up top. If we take a look at the cpu.shares file, we can see the same value here. So that's what it looks like to use C groups with Docker.
Cgroups are an important part of Linux containers, but are also useful for regular processes. The functionality to monitor resource utilization and set resource limits can be used independently. You now know more about how cgroups work and where you can configure them. If you're using a container runtime or orchestrator and want to play around with cgroups manually, you should keep in mind what dependencies there might be on the existing hierarchy. For example, Amazon ECS uses the cgroup hierarchy to know where to read CPU and memory utilization information, and cAdvisor does the same. You can find additional documentation about cgroups in the Linux kernel source tree. Next up, let's talk about namespaces. Namespaces are another Linux kernel primitive. Namespaces are concerned with controlling visibility of resources and access control. Namespaces can make it appear to the process that it has its own, isolated copy of a given resource. In other cases, namespaces can map resources outside a namespace to a resource inside a namespace, while changing some properties like names or permissions. When a process makes a change to a resource within its namespace, generally that change is visible only within the namespace, not to processes outside. The process effectively has its own private copy. Linux has a bunch of namespaces that cover different kinds of resources. On this slide, you can see the namespaces that are available in recent versions of Linux. New namespaces are being developed as well, but time namespace is expected to become available in newer versions of Linux. Just like with cgroups, processes can be in any combination of namespaces. This diagram attempts to demonstrate that processes can share different sets of namespaces with each other. For example, you might have a mount namespace that is shared between most processes, but want to run one of them in a separate network or PID namespace. Or you might want to run a process with its own namespaces, much like a container. I want to talk about a couple of namespaces that are commonly used in containers. We'll start with the network namespace. The network namespace gives a process a separated view of the network, with different network interfaces and routing rules. Network namespaces can be connected together using a virtual Ethernet device pair, or VETH pair. Docker typically uses a separate network namespace per container, and by default configures each container's namespace such that it has a VETH pair connected to a Linux bridge to enable outbound connectivity. But that's not the only way to do networking with containers. For example, Kubernetes pods and ECS tasks get a unified view of the network, and a single IP address exposed to address all of the containers in the same pod or task. One of the hallmarks of Linux containers is that they have a separate view of the file system, with their own set of files from the container image. Mount namespaces are the mechanism for providing this separate view. The container image is mounted as the container's root file system, hiding the host file system from view. To share data across containers or between the host and a container, we typically talk about using volumes. Volumes are really a mount added to the container's mount namespace. There are more interesting things going on with file systems and containers that we'll cover in a bit. The PROC virtual file system is a mechanism that the Linux kernel exposes for introspection of its data. This file system includes lots of information about each process that's running. One of the pieces of information that's available is the namespaces to which the process belongs. Inside the process directory is a directory called ns. This directory contains symbolic links to the namespace. However, they're not quite regular symbolic links that point to files. These use the symbolic link structure to note the namespace type and inode number that the kernel uses to identify the namespace. The number itself isn't really meaningful, but you can use it to understand whether two processes belong to the same namespace or not. I want to take a look at how you can manipulate namespaces. Unlike cgroups, namespaces are not manipulated through a virtual file system. Instead, a set of Linux syscalls are used for working with the namespaces. There are two syscalls that can be used to create new namespaces, clone and unshare. Clone is a syscall for creating processes. As part of its functionality, it can start the new process in a new namespace. Which namespaces it creates is controlled by a set of flags that start with clone new. Unshare is a syscall that a running process can use to move itself into a new namespace. Unshare supports the same flags as clone. Unlike cgroups, namespaces can't be empty. Something must be inside the namespace for it to exist. Namespaces automatically close when nothing is holding them open. There are two options for occupying a namespace, either a running process or a bind mount. When you have a bind mount, the kernel will maintain the namespace independently of a running process. This means that if the initial process that created the namespace exits while the bind mount exists, the namespace stays around. You can create your own bind mount of one of these namespace symlinks anywhere else you want with the mount command or syscall. Some tools, like IP netNS, expect to operate on bind mounts at particular paths. 
For a running process to enter an existing namespace, it can use the setNS syscall. This syscall requires a file descriptor to act as the identifier for the target namespace to enter. The file descriptor can be obtained by opening one of the namespace symlinks in PROC, or by opening a bind mount of it elsewhere on your system. Once a process has moved into a namespace, it holds the namespace open even if the original symlink or bind mount goes away. There are a couple of tools that can help you enter namespaces without making the syscalls yourself, nsenter and ipnetns. Let's take a look at some namespaces. I want to start out with network namespaces. First, I want to show you what the host's network looks like right now. We can see three interfaces here. First, a loopback interface called LO. This is the interface that is used for localhost. Second, the Ethernet interface that this computer has called ETH0. This is the host's network connection to the world. Third, a Linux bridge called Docker0. This is what Docker uses for container networking. I want to show you what happens when we create a new network namespace. I'm going to use a utility called unshare to create the new namespace, and then run the same IP link program inside. We can see different output here. Instead of three interfaces, we see only a single interface called LO, and it's actually a different LO than the one that we saw before, as this is inside the new network namespace. Now, as we talked about before, namespaces go away when nothing holds them open. Since I ran the IP program and it just exited, the namespace is gone. Let's start a shell inside the namespace and do this again, so we can look at it a bit more. Now we're operating inside a new shell, inside the new network namespace. We can run the same IP command again and get the same output. So we see the same single interface that we saw before. Now let's figure out how to make this namespace persistent. We talked about the symlink files in the proc file system, so let's look at those. These are the symlinks that point to namespace inodes. We can make the namespace persist by creating a bind mount. The location I mounted it to is used by the IPNetNS tool, so let's look at it with that tool. IPNetNS can list the persistent namespace and properly identify that our shell is running in that namespace. Now let's exit the shell. If we hadn't created that bind mount, the namespace would be gone, but we have, so it's still around. We can see it again with IPNetNS. IPNetNS can still list that namespace, and correctly identifies that we're no longer running in that namespace. We can use the IPNetNS tool to examine the namespace again, and see that it looks just as before. Let's take a look at namespaces with Docker. We can use Docker to run a common container like Redis. Docker started a container for us in the background named Redis. We can look at how it sets up the namespaces. Now we know the identifier of the namespace. Let's grab what Docker thinks the IP address is. Let's look inside the namespace to see if that's right. We can see the IP matches up. We know that Docker connects the container to the Docker0 bridge with a VETH pair. Let's look at it. And we can see the other end here. OK, let's try running something other than Redis inside this same network namespace. We'll need to grab Redis's PID again, and we can use that to start our program. Now we've got Nginx running inside that network namespace. Normally, you can run Nginx and make a request to localhost. But that's not working. Is Nginx running? Let's get that container's IP address again and try to reach Nginx on that IP. Neat, isn't it? We've played around with network namespaces a couple of times. Let's try playing with a different namespace. In the last demo, we ran a binary from the host inside the container's network namespace. In this demo, I want to use a binary from the container and run it on the host. Let's start up a Redis container to play with. Redis has a simple text API. Let's grab the IP address of the container. Now we can use Telnet to connect to it. The easiest API to try is ping, 
we can see that Redis is responding, so let's quit this session. We ran Redis from a container. Redis isn't installed on the host, and we can see that if we try to run it. But I can use the Redis binary in the container and run it inside all of the other host namespaces. To enter a namespace, we need one of those special files in PROC. We still have the Redis container process running, so we can grab a reference to one of those files with the containerized Redis processes PID. Then we can use NSENter with the target and mount options to enter the mount namespace. And we can see that Redis starts up. Now we can switch to another terminal and try hitting that as well. And we can use the same ping API. And it's working. We just saw how to use the NSENter and IP NetNS tools to enter namespaces and examine the resources that are visible. You can use these tools to help you troubleshoot when things aren't quite working the way you expect and monitor to see what your containers are up to. More information on namespaces is available in Section 7 of the Linux Programmer's Manual, which is included in most Linux distributions by default. For this next section, I want to talk about container images and what makes them work. Container images are fundamentally a set of files and directories that make up the user land, or regular software, that runs inside a container. In many cases, container images are very similar to the files and directories that make up a regular Linux system or a virtual machine. Images help to describe the installed state of a system. Images make it easy to start multiple copies of the same software, which makes them really popular in virtualization and container contexts. You can think of a container image as a fancy tar or zip file. One of the things that makes it fancy is the concept of layers. Layers are a mechanism of composing together files and directories. The layers are merged together, creating a unified view. This is really useful as a foundation for inheritance, creating a new derivative container image based on some other existing image. For example, I might have an image that contains an application installed in Debian and inherit from the official Debian image. Layers provide a copy-on-write view of the files in the image. When you add a new file, it exists only in the topmost writable layer. However, if you are only reading a file, it can remain in the original layer without duplicating storage. Layers support modified files and deleted files by hiding the original. A modified file is created by copying up the original and modifying it in the top layer. The modified file hides the file it was based on. Deletion is similar. The original file is hidden in the lower layer. Layers are typically implemented on some sort of union file system. A union file system provides a mechanism for having a merged view of files and directories, like what is needed for layers. Implementing layers with a union file system can help you get efficiency in making minor changes to images. Instead of copying the whole image, you can add a new layer with just your minor changes. Using a union file system can help you start up new containers more quickly. You don't need to duplicate the whole image to start up a new one. Instead, you can add a new, empty layer on top for each container. That way, the container can have its own writable space without interfering with other containers. Overlay is a union file system that is built into Linux. It joins together two or more directories, called upper-dir and lower-dir, to form a union. Overlay uses file names to describe the files. A file in the upper-dir with the same name as one in the lower-dir hides the lower-dir's file. When both the upper-dir and the lower-dir have a directory of the same name, the directories are merged together instead of the upper-dir hiding the entire lower-dir. When writing to the overlay, only the upper-dir is ever modified. Existing files in the lower-dir that are open for write are copied to the upper-dir before the open syscall succeeds. This means that large files can take a very long time to open and take up twice as much space, even if you only want to change one bit. When you delete a file in the upper dir, it doesn't actually get deleted from the backing lower dir. Instead, the overlay file system creates a special whiteout in the upper dir. Files and directories have different whiteout implementations. This does mean that overlay cannot store every kind of file because these particular whiteouts are used as a special indicator or marker. An upper dir can have multiple lower dirs, which are ordered. Docker uses this to implement the layer storage that we saw before. Overlays are a special kind of mount. You can create an overlay by mounting with the overlay file system type and specifying the parameters for upper dir, lower dir, and diff directory, which is used for in-progress work like copy up. You can see the mounts in standard places, like the mount command and in the proc file system. The proc file system will also show you what a given process can see in its own mount namespace. Each process will have its own results in the mount info file. Docker's default storage uses the overlay file system. That's also the default on Amazon Linux, in ECS, and in EKS. 
Docker creates its overlay mounts in var live docker overlay2. You can see the storage and poke around at it there. I generally would not recommend writing directly to it though, as you can break the immutability of Docker images. Let's look at a Docker image and see how it works. First, we'll pull an image from a regular Linux distribution. Images like this are commonly used as a base for building application-specific container images. Docker stores its data inside a directory called var live docker. When you pull an image, Docker needs to store metadata about that image, including its name. It does so in an image subdirectory. Docker uses a JSON document called a manifest to describe the parts of an image. It stores the manifest in a directory named after the SHA-256 digest of the document. We can look at it here. We can see here the different things that are in the manifest, including the default configuration for containers created from this image, and a reference to the layers that make up the image. The actual layers are stored in a different directory. Docker supports multiple different ways of providing the container file system to a container in the form of what it calls storage drivers, formerly known as graph drivers. These drivers typically perform a union file system copy on write implementation. We're using the overlay2 driver, which is the default in Docker. Overlay2 uses a subdirectory called overlay2 to store its data. There are a few different kinds of things in here. I'm going to tell you about each of them in turn. First, there's a file here called backing fs block dev. You can see a B listed as the file type, which indicates a block device. The device numbers are shown next to the owner, 259,1. These are the same device numbers that are used for the device where this directory is mounted. We can see that with lsblk. And by examining the device itself. Docker created this device node as a shortcut. In order to create an overlay mount, Linux requires that the upper and working directories are on the same device. Docker uses this device node so it knows what device that is. The next thing to look at is the directory with a long name. This is where Docker creates the necessary directories for creating an overlay mount. If we look at the diff directory, we can see the file system in this layer. There's also another file besides the diff directory. This is a marker Docker made for itself rather than part of the overlay mount. We'll come back to this a little later. We see what one of these directories looks like for an image that we pulled with a single layer. I want to take a look at an image with multiple layers. I have a simple Docker file here that specifies a couple of layers. When we build this Docker file, we'll end up with three layers. The first is the layer that we already looked at, which is the Amazon Linux image that we pulled. The second will create a file called hello, and the third will remove that file. Let's build it. Now we can look at the overlay2 directory to find the layers and we can see three layer directories here, one that we looked at before and two new ones. Let's look at the new ones. This looks about the same as the directory that we looked at at first, except that we see a couple of new things. Let's look at the diff directory first, since we saw that before. You can see here the regular hello file, but nothing else. This directory is storing only the files that are unique to the layer. Let's look at the second layer to see what's in there. This looks similar so far. Let's check the diff directory. This time we still see something called hello, but it's not quite a regular file. Instead, we can see that it's a character device indicated by the C at the beginning of the line, and that it has the major and minor device numbers of zero. This is what overlay uses as a whiteout marker and indicates that the hello file should be hidden. Let's take a look at some of the other things in these directories. First, let's look at the work directory. This directory is empty. It's really used as temporary storage for files that are being copied up into this layer, so it's typically going to remain empty except during those operations. Next, let's look at the link file. This file contains a short identifier that's used as a reference for other layers. If we look in the overlay2 directory above the layer, there's a subdirectory there called L that has symlinks with these names. If we look at the name reference in this file, we can see that there's a symlink in that directory that points back to this layer. These names are used in the next file that we'll look at, the lower file. This file records the layers that are underneath this layer in order. For this layer, you can see too, the layer that had the original hello file and the base Amazon Linux layer. So far we've just looked at images. I want to show you what changes once we create a container. Let's make a container from the image that we built. If we look at the overlay2 directory, we should see some new entries created for the container. We see two new directories, one with the suffix of init. Let's look at the one called init first. 
These are files that Docker creates for each container. They include settings that are customized for the container, like its hostname and DNS settings. The other directory without the init suffix is where the container can write its data. This is ultimately what gets mounted as the operator with overlay. We can look at it and see that it's empty for now. Let's start this container and look at its mounts. We can see here the overlay file system that is mounted in this container. You can see at the beginning of the line that the mount point is slash, and you can also see the options that control the lower DIRs and upper DIR. You can also see that the lower DIRs are referenced by the symlinks that we saw earlier, instead of the full paths. This is to reduce the total number of characters in the lower DIR option. If we look outside the container, we can see the same thing. This shows you the same mount, except now you see the mount point as what it is outside the container. If you look closely, you can see that the mount point is a directory called merged. Let's look at that. This looks like the container's root file system. Let's make a new file in the container. We can see it when we look at the merge directory, and also in the diff directory. We can also do this in reverse. We can create a file in the diff directory, and then see that same file in the container. Now that you understand more about how container images and Docker layers work, you can apply this knowledge to troubleshoot. You now know where to look for space taken up by hidden files, and you know the impact of modifying files that exist in your images. You can find additional documentation about the overlay file system in the Linux kernel source tree. The last topic I want to cover in this talk is container runtimes. There are many different definitions of a container runtime. For this talk, I'm taking a very broad interpretation, the software tool that helps you run containers on a host. This typically means setting up cgroups, namespaces, and the file system for the container. Docker is probably the most well-known and define much of the user experience that people now expect in the container space. The Open Containers Initiative is a group that was started to standardize aspects of containers, including interactions with the runtimes, the image format, and distribution protocol or registry API. As a part of starting this group, Docker donated a core piece called RunC. RunC is now the reference implementation of the OCI runtime standard and is used by other container runtimes, including Docker, Containerd, and Cryo. The Open Containers Initiative has a specification for runtimes that defines the interfaces used for running containers. The unit of a container in the runtime spec is a bundle. Bundles consist of a file system and a JSON formatted file that describes how the container should be configured. The file system can be a union, like Docker does with its layers, but it doesn't have to be. It could be any arbitrary directory or device that the runtime supports. The JSON document describes all the basic Linux technologies that comprise a container, including the ones we talked about today, like cgroups and namespaces. The spec allows for fairly flexible configuration, including sharing arbitrary cgroups and namespaces. The spec also allows for hooks that can mutate the bundle at different points in the lifecycle. Hooks are separate programs that are run at different parts of the container lifecycle. They have the ability to influence how a container is configured and to instrument its lifecycle. Hooks that run before a container starts can mutate container resources like the root file system or the JSON file. Hooks that run after start or after stop can perform actions like notifying some other component. Docker doesn't make it easy to add hooks, but you can add runtimes and use those to inject hooks instead. Let's take a look at an OCI bundle. I'll start a simple container in the background. Docker delegates to Containerd for managing containers, and then Containerd invokes RunC. Containerd creates the bundle here. We can see a directory was created for the container that we're running. This is the bundle. We can see the configuration as part of the config.json file. We can see the whole configuration of the container here. This includes the user and group, the program that runs when we run the container, the environment variables, capabilities, mounts, hooks, cgroups, namespaces, and more. The config file also describes the location of the root file system. We can see that here. This is the same merged path that we saw before. A quick note before we end, I'd love your feedback on my talk, both if you loved it or if you have suggestions for improvement. But please keep in mind, for my talk and for the others that you watch, that the speakers are human and will be reading your feedback. Linux Fest Northwest is operating a discussion board at https colon slash slash discuss.lfnw.org, and there will be a thread about this talk posted there. I'll be watching that thread to answer any questions you have.
In addition, I'm on Twitter, and I'm happy to answer questions about containers there as well. My Twitter handle is at Samuel Karp. Thank you so much for watching my talk. I hope you learned something new about containers.